Okay, vino ma donai no heno alina ma si al dene kon nane ma si al dene koneu. I'd like to thank once again for being graciously invited to the Sephardic congregation of Hewlett. Uh, I'd like to de- dedicate the Shiltonai for Rufash Lema for Naftali Tzvi Ben Ruth. El Narafana Lo, El Narafana Lo, El Narafana Lo. How we do? Let's start with men first. Shevach Ben Hatun Hana. Begam. Avraham. David. Ben Malka. Begam. Avraham Ben. Chaya Urul. Urul. Udul. Men. Dov Mordechai Ben. Basa. Chaya. The Gam Gabriel Ben Lea Luba El Narafana Lehem El Narafana Lehem El Narafana Lehem And also for Fash Lema for ladies Ilana Bat Naima Vigam Sharona Bat Lea Luba Vigam Bat El Bat Lea Luba Vigam Hana Rachel Bat Lea the Gam Lea Bat Chava. The Gam Miriam Bat Hana. Zelda Bat Rahel. Zelda Zelda Bat Rahel. The Gam Mafrat. Bat Zelpo. The Gam Eliza. Bat Mazal. El Narafana Lahel. Nina. Bat Rena. El Narafana Lahen. El Narafana Lahen. El Narafana Lahen. Okay, in the school to the Torah we learned tonight, may all those people have refreshed their mind. Be able to return back to doing full mitzvot. Huh? Lavdil ben Haim le Metim, le Yulun Shmat. Roma Rahami ben Frida. Vigam Nefesh. Zahava. Bat Tova. Vigam Nefesh, Shlomo ben Tzara. Ruach Adurai Tenechem Megan Eden. Okay. So last week we read Parashat. And Bezat Hashem this Shabbat we're going to read Parashat Shemini and also Parashat Para. I'm going to focus on the Parashat Hashavua, both Sav and Shemini, and see if we can find some type of a comparison between the two of them. So in Parashat Sav, in Vaikra, chapter 6, verses number 5 and 6, it says, the Esh Alam is Beach to Kad Bo Lotich Be. Ubi Er Aleha Kohen Atim Baboke Baboke, the Arach Alea Haula, the Ki Alech El Beha Shilamim. It's talking about on the Mizbeach, there was a fire. Obviously, the Mizbeach was a very big barbecue. There's no barbecue without fire. Yes? So on the Mizbeach, the Torah tells us there has to be Esh Alam is Beach. We have to make sure that the fire on the Mizbeach is not extinguished, doesn't go out. Lo The Kohenim have to put Kohenim have to put wood on the fire. The and on this fire we put the put the Ola. Ola is a korban that all goes to Hashem. And also the shilamim, which are the korbanot, that are the, the ones that we eat from, some of us eat from, we put them on the altar as well. So that's the first pasuk, the esh al So we see from here, we learn, there's a lot to aseh, a negative prohibition, that kohanim must make sure that what? That there has to be the fire always there. They're not allowed to extinguish the flame of the mizbeach. A kohen who takes fire off the mizbeach and extinguishes it, is over, is violating a negative precept in the Torah. Then there's another pasuk right afterward that says, Esh tamid tukad ala mizbech lo tichbeh. Fire should be on the altar always, you shall not extinguish. Why does the Torah have to repeat this pasuk here? The first pasuk, pasuk hey, already told me that we're not allowed to have a fire that is extinguished on the mizbeach. What is added? What is added by the second pasuk? What is added by the second verse that once again mentions esh tamid? What is esh tamid? A fire that is everlasting. Well, if we don't extinguish it, then of course it's 
Everlasting. And then the Torah returns and says, Lo tichbe, you shall not extinguish. You already said Lo tichbe in the Pasuk before. So many of the Mephashim give answer about this. I'd like to focus a little bit on the Ramban. Nachmanides. It says here, what is it? Shetukad b'mizbeach kol halayla. What is kol halayla? That there's a mitzvah for the Kohanim to put enough wood. That's okay. Remember, the, the, the mizbeach was not a gas barbecue. Right? It was not gas, it was wood. So the, what? Propane. No, no propane. Sorry. Wood. And so they had to put enough wood on the altar, on the mizbeach, so that it would burn, not just during the day, but the Mizbeach, the fire had to be burning all night long. So the Kohanim had to be very, very careful to put enough wood on the fire to make sure that all night long the fire was burning. Why would it have to burn at night? Because the Torah says it has to be in a continuous fire, not just in the day, but at night. It specifically says, focus on Baboker, Baboker, and then it talks about the Laila. Okay. Now the Rambam says, the way I understand this, what it says in the second pasuk, which is the repetition of the prohibition of allowing the fire or causing the fire to be extinguished, there's a mitzvah in the first pasuk for the Kohanim to maintain the fire. That we know. Like it says, Ubi'er aleha kohen etzim. The Kohen have to put enough wood on the fire so the, so on the mitzvah so the fire would get light. And they have to put it up that it'll be all night long. But what about the second pasuk? So he says, first of all, what happens if the Kohanim are lazy? Kohanim generally are not lazy. Certainly not in the temple. The Kohanim was rezim. They were very zealous. So what if the Kohanim are lazy and they don't put enough wood? And the esh went out because there was not <laughs> enough wood? They violated a negative precept. And that's why it says, our rabbis teach us, that the Ramban says over here that there was another fire on the Mizbeach, which means there was the fire that was one, where they did the Korbanot, and there was a separate fire on the side. And what was the purpose of that fire on the side? To maintain the fire. So you can imagine you have a bonfire and you're throwing a lot of meat on there. That's what they do with the Korbanot. When you throw meat on, what happens? Sometimes the flame goes down a little bit. So they had this extra uh, bonfire there uh, that way they would break, basically take things from there to add to the Mizbeach so the fire should not go out. <coughs> then the Ramban adds, and he says, why the repetition? The first one is talking about the Kohanim. The second one is talking about all the Jewish people. All the Jewish people, every person, is not allowed to extinguish any of the flame on the altar. Now, of course, we have to ask ourselves a question. Is a non-Kohen allowed to go anywhere near the flame of the altar? No. no. Nope. A czar, a non-Kohen, is permitted to do the shechita, if he knows how. Permitted to do the shechita. But from kabbalat hadam, which means after you do the shechita, there's the blood that comes out of the animal. That's called dam hanefesh. The blood that spurts out when you do the shechita. We have to know this kind of stuff. You know, when we buy meat in the store, we have to remember that uh, it, didn't come, it didn't come that way. So there's a shechita that happens, and then there's blood that comes out. That blood, by the way, if a Jew takes that blood, not why a Jew would do something like that, and drinks it, is hayav karet. Is guilty of a punishment of karet. If we drink the blood that comes out of the animal when it is shechted, the blood that spurts out. What about the blood in the rest of the animal? There's blood in the heart, there's blood in the veins. If you turn the animal upside down, the blood will drain out, yes? That blood is a lotaser, a Jew who has a rivi'it, 3.8 ounces of that type of blood is a lotaser, and you get lashes for that. But there's another type of blood that is prohibited by the rabbis. And that's the blood that's contained within the flesh of the animal. Not the blood that's in the vessels, but the blood that's in the flesh of the animal, like the blood in the muscle. That blood, what do we do about that blood? Exactly! I mean, when I was growing up as a kid, 
you'd be able to go to the store and there was two, way, two, two things you could buy as far as meat is concerned. One, you could buy meat that was soaked and salted, and then you could buy meat that was not soaked and salted. Nowadays, good luck in any of these stores finding meat that is not soaked and salted. You're not going to find it. And you know what they do, though. Really? Yeah, the butcher over there, and you know what actually did. I noticed that. Was, I wouldn't buy from them. I noticed some of the meat says it's not soaked and salted. Yeah. That's yep. very... Is it a busser cusher? Chicken, uh, chicken is. But is it a busser cusher? Like a busser cusher, you know? I don't know. When I was growing up, you'd see busser cusher, right? Soaked and salted. I was like, really? Surprised. So, meat nowadays, you really can't buy that way. Olden days, when I was growing up in the generation before, that's because women, and this was generally done by ladies, men, I'm not sure, knew how to do this, but women, they would soak and salt meat. Where'd they learn it from? Their mother. Their mother. Where'd their mother learn it from? Their mother. Their mother. All the way back to? All the way back when? Moshe, yes? Moshe's time. Moshe Rabbeinu's time. Exactly. So the ladies sort of passed down the tradition. Somehow it got lost in the shuffle a little bit. Most women do not know how to soak and salt meat. So therefore, the stores started to do the soaking and salting themselves. There's another reason why one would buy meat that is not soaked and salted. If you put meat on a barbecue... And you roast it. It does not need to be soaked and salted. Barbecued meat, by the natural process of the barbecue, all the blood and additional other things drip down out. So roasting meat, I'm talking about muscle, that's most of the meat in the animal, that does not need to be soaked and salted. Now everything is soaked and salted because unfortunately many people don't know how to soak and salt and they don't know the halakha. If you take meat that is not soaked and salted, you put it in a pot with water, and you cook it, that's a, that's a rabbinic prohibition. Because what happens when you cook it is the blood comes out of the flesh of the meat, goes into the pot, and then you are cooking the meat inside a combination of water and blood. And that is not allowed from the rabbinic. That's rabbinically prohibited. That's why you have kosher salt. Right? Yeah. Even though it's hard to understand how you can have salt that's not kosher. <laughs> and my favorite is when on salt you see kosher for Pesach, really. Where does it come from? So why is it called So why is it kosher salt? Because they were thick and that allowed you to be able to soak and salt the meat effectively. That's why it was called kosher salt. Really, it should be said kosher ring salt. That's what it really was. Okay? So that's the whole idea of blood. We're not allowed to have that. And liver, just as an aside, just to get through there, liver is a type of meat that cannot be soaked and salted. Why? Because you could do that till you turn blue. It's not going to get all the blood out. So the only way one can cook liver, if you choose to eat that despite the high cholesterol and other problems with liver, is you must roast it. If it's not roasted, it's not kosher. Okay? Sorry? Absolutely. Once you roast it, all the, all, the, all the blood is gone. Then you can do whatever you want with it. You can hang it up on your wall. <laughs> is that why you should, can't you broil it? That's what it's Same thing. It's broil, roast, about. all nice different terms. I don't know the difference between two of them. Basically, you have a grill, you have the meat, you have a fire underneath. Broil, you have a grill, you have the meat, fires on top. Yes? At the end of the day, same process. Okay. So we see here that there's a concept of we have to have fire on the altar, yes? And it has to be there all the time. So our rabbis teach us that there were three different piles of fire on the Mizbeach. There was one that was called the Ma'aracha Gidola, the big bonfire. And on the big bonfire, what did they put on the big bonfire? That's where they put all the korbanot, the sacrifices. Then on the side of the Ma'aracha Gidola, right next to the big bonfire, there was another fire there, and that's where the Kohen takes a shovel, takes some of the wood with fire on it, and puts it on the Mizbeach HaZahav, which was in the Kodesh, and then puts the incense on there, and this is how you have a nice smell in the temple. You know, slaughterhouses don't really smell that nice. So therefore we have incense to show, first of all, to make it smell nice, but even more so to show the connection between man and God. And then we have a third fire, which we've already talked about, which is called the fire for Kiyum Ha'esh, which is that's the fire that has nothing put on it, and there's nothing removed from it except to support the fire of the Marach HaGadolah. 
So when I was looking this on Shabbat, I said to myself, that reminds me of three things. First of all, what is this concept of esh? Let's, let's go from a drusher point of view. What is this esh? What is this fire? Salt. Salt. No, soul. Like a human soul. All right. So, but we don't, we don't, we don't sacrifice human beings. No, like a nefesh. Like Just read the Haftarah. I'm glad you bring that up. The Haftarah, it's very interesting. If you look at the Haftarah from last week's parasha, it talks about how what an abomination how disgusting and detestable it is for a man to sacrifice another man or a woman. Why would one do that? What is the It's so foreign to us to even think about it. But the Tanakh is talking about this type of worship of Avodah Zarah. Ma'avir beno bitola molech. This is a kind of Avodah Zarah where parents would sacrifice their children in this type of way. Don't get nervous, little man. This is a long time ago. <laughs> Even though sometimes your father might want to kill you, he doesn't really mean it. Uh, sound like the Mayans. What is the, tell me the concept. Some of the Goyim still do it, but up until a couple hundred years ago, three, four hundred years ago, Goyim was still doing it regularly. Mayans, Aztecs. What is the concept? What is the desire? First of all, tell me something. What, a korban, what is the concept? We're studying the book of Vayikra. We're learning about Korbanot. Let's understand what a Korbanot. Is to get close to Hashem. Very good. Karo. Very good. Hebrew is a holy language. The word Korban comes from the word Karov, which means close. Which means a person, when he brings a Korban, gets close to God. Can you tell me how that works? I have a barbecue in front of my house, and I, that doesn't get me close to God. <laughs> what about a barbecue in the temple is different? Because it's the house of Hashem. Okay, so if we have a barbecue in the synagogue, that's a mikdash me'at. It's a, if we have, I'm not sure you could do this over here, we die of carbon monoxide poisoning. <laughs> but if you figure out a way to get the carbon monoxide out, what if we had a barbecue right here? Would that be uh, closer to God? How does that work? If you had the carbon monoxide, maybe. <laughs> no, that, that, yeah, that gets you real close. That's, pay attention to the end of class. That's what I'm going to talk about. They used to burn the fat also more smoke. So more smoke? That's going to make it a better, closer to God? You see smoke? That's what Hashem wanted. We can't, you can't do something on your own that Hashem doesn't want. Okay, Hashem wants us to put on tefillin. Is that reach nichoach? I like that idea, but we need to understand what is, the, we don't call tefillin korban. Even though I would agree with you, every mitzvah makes a Jew closer to God. There's no question about it because we're following the will of God, yes. But what is unique about a korban that it deserves to have a word that contains within it karov? Because you bring the korban instead of the person. That makes you close to God? Instead of uh, bringing korban, Okay, so let me picture for you. It's hard for most of us to recognize this because, you know, it's been such a long time since we had the temple. Such a long time. You know, we can go back ten generations and nobody knows what a temple looks like. Yes? So, let's say, and maybe this doesn't happen to anybody. I, it happens to everybody, I think. But let's say you're feeling a little spiritually low. It happens every now and then, Yes? And you feel you need to get yourself a charge. You want to f- want to pick yourself up. Nowadays, what do you do? You come to Bet Knesset, you pray, maybe you learn a little Torah, a lot of Torah, you come to Shur, we have a motivational speaker, give you a good whatever so you can get closer to God, yes. But in the time of the temple, there was another option. And that other option is, I take a trip to Jerusalem, not because I want to see Ben Yehuda and Rehov George, but I go to, that's by the way, not technically in Jerusalem, but we'll leave that alone. Okay? We go to Rehov, we wanted to go to Yerushalayim, we go to the temple, and I bring or buy a korban there. And when I go to the temple, what do I see? Ten miracles, open miracles, every single day. Look at Pirkei Avot. It mentions the ten nisim that happened Every single day. I'll give you an example. 
Anybody ever been to a slaughterhouse? Yes. Flies everywhere. My gosh, flies can smell dying animals two minutes before they die. There was no, flies. no flies in the temple. Was this only the first temple? Both. No flies. No flies. No flies. Now. A lot of Torah, that's why. I don't know about that. <laughs> what else? The, the, Let me ask a question. The, the fire that you were talking about never went out. The fire on the Mizbeach never went out. Well, we just said that Kohanim have to make an effort to make sure the fire doesn't go out. Which means they have to put enough wood so the fire doesn't go out. But let me ask you a question. The Mizbeach that we have, where we have this big bonfire, outdoors or indoors? Outdoors! What? Carbon monoxide still killed people back then, too? Smoke stays straight. Anybody have... No, we didn't get to that yet. We'll get to that. Anybody been to Israel in the middle of the winter? Yeah. Windy. It's very windy. Uh, wind. Rain. No, how about rain? Pouring. Pouring rain. <laughs> and how do you keep the fire going when it's raining cats and dogs? Despite the rain, the fire never went out, which means the Kohanim had to put enough wood to maintain the fire, but there was nothing from a natural point of view with rain that would put the fire out. The Ketoret, the smoke from the Ketoret went in one direction, up, regardless of the wind. A person was able to smell the Ketoret in Yericho. So these are some of the miracles that we saw every single day in the temple. So many of us would say, you know what, I, I'd love to, you know, I need to see a miracle today. I need a miracle every day. That was a <laughs> song in 1977, The Grateful Dead. You want to see a miracle? You got 10. All you got to do is bring a korban to the temple. So that experience, plus you had the music, you had the Levim singing, you had the smell. It was like a way of attacking all of your senses. And you, of course, felt the presence of God. As much as we feel the presence of God in the synagogue, as much as we feel the presence of God in front of the Kotel of Ma'aravi, inside the temple when it was built and standing, you felt the presence of God. And this was basically a spiritual boost, like an inoculation. And so when you bring the Korban, it makes you close, number one, because of the entire experience. Now, some people have to bring a Korban because they sin called Korban Chatat. What's the idea of an animal dying for you? What, korban, what things do we bring Korban for? What sins? What type of sins do we bring a sacrifice for? There is no sacrifice for murder. If a person killed somebody, the shogeg, right? Which means he's walking under a ladder. He didn't pay attention to somebody on top of the ladder. He hits the ladder. The guy falls down and dies. He doesn't bring a korban for that. What does he do? He goes to Irmiklat. So for murder, there is no sacrifice. Okay, asham is something else. What I'm talking about, korban chatat. Shogeg. This is going to be very important. You'll see in a second. Shogeg. You only bring a korban for something that you did where you were missing knowledge. You either didn't know it was Shabbat and you lit a fire, or you forgot or didn't know that lighting a fire on Shabbat is not allowed. That is an absence of knowledge. You don't know something about the Shabbat or you don't realize it's Shabbat. Then you bring a korban chatat. The only thing you bring a korban chatat for is a sin that you do unintentionally. That if you would have done it purposely, carries with it the death penalty or karet. Like if you, like you accidentally lean on a light switch on Shabbos. Accidentally is not shogeg. <laughs> that is mit asek. That's something else. That is not asur. When a lady gives birth, they bring the... That's different. That's because there's many answers. That's a different. That's called a korban. That's a yoleda. That's for yoleda. That's not called a chatat, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we'll learn about that in two weeks, okay? But chatat, korban chatat is brought for any sin that a person had, if a person takes blood, thinks it's regular blood from the animal's flesh, but actually is blood that comes out of the animal and you shecht it, and drinks it, he didn't realize that it was blood that carries with the karet that you bring korban chatat. A person eats chelev, unintentionally, 
Korban Chatat. Which means it has to be a sin that would normally carry with it a death penalty, either by the court or by Shamaim. But he did it unintentionally, so he's not guilty of a death penalty. He has to bring Korban Chatat. Oh, so like if you accidentally somehow confuse turkey bacon and regular bacon. Bacon is not death penalty. Chazir is lashes. If a person ate chazir unintentionally, he would not bring korban chatat. Okay? And a korban chatat is brought for a sin that you've already done. There's no, you know what, I'm going to sin tomorrow. Let me bring a you know, I'm in Jerusalem anyway. Let me throw an extra one in there so this way if I sin tomorrow, I don't have to make a trip back. That doesn't work. It's funny, but we'll see why in a second why it's not so funny. Then we'll get back to what I want to talk about here. Is there a line to bring a carbon? A lot. What do you mean a line? Like, is there like, busy? Like, yeah. Read Josephus. Josephus talks about how busy it was and how the Kohanim was so perfect to what they did that they were able, it was not like the DMV, they were able to manage a large, large volume of people. And imagine Korban Pesach, every Jewish male, you know, in groups of ten, one comes. You know how many Korbanot that was they had to do? It was three shifts they did. Is, is, is that why, uh, like, when you go to the Kotel now for the metal detector during Slichos, they don't check your bags? They have the same concept of how they're able to just uh, profile you right through the uh, metal detectors? I have no idea about that. I, I can't even, I'm not, I can't. No, it's I'm like, not even going to venture a guess about it's that. There's no line. It's like normally you have metal detectors, so it'll be like, it'll take you a week to get in. You get in with like 10 minutes. I don't think too many terrorists show up at 5.30 in the morning. This, this was they wait sh- until people show up. This was like 9 o'clock at night. Slichot at night? Svaradim? Svaradim. And the Kotel Slichot at night? Oi, va, voy. And the Kotel was packed. You're better off staying home. <laughs> we don't say Slichot at night. Svaradim, do not do Slichot at night before Chatzot. You're better off staying home. Uh, if you look at the Nisbeya, it wasn't <laughs> such a big uh, thing. So how come they brought so many sacrifices? wasn't such a big thing. No, it was the surface. It was uh, ten amot high. It was a miracle. It was high, but... Uh, it, was wa- it was big. No, no, it was not small. Uh, oh, it was only four amot uh, square. Four am- it, 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 it was only four amot square. So that's eight feet. Square. Eight feet small, by... Small. Okay, but eight feet is big. At 20 feet high, with a ramp that goes up. Anyway, let's not talk about the, the size, okay? Well, let's talk about the... So a person goes there, brings a sack. Why do you bring an animal? Because you can't bring a human? We're going to talk about that. Why, what, how does an animal help? When you bring korban chatat, you have to be somech yadav. You have to lean on the animal with your weight. Why are you doing that? Because really you're saying to yourself, that should have been me. I was careless. I should have studied the halakha. I should have gone to the rabbi's class. I chose not to. I should have remembered it was Shabbat. I forgot. So you lean on the animal because what you're really trying to say is that should be me dying. The animal is going to die as a substitution for me. And that's why you want an animal that's perfect without any blemishes. So now tell me how we get the human sacrifice. What was the appeal for the goyim and very, very few Jews, but there was some. What was the appeal of human sacrifice? Animal's not a human being. Yeah. Animal has... What's, uh, what else do we know about an animal? An animal is unique. How is an animal better than a human being? They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't have, have any nefesh. They have no sin. They have sin but free will. If they have no sin, that means it's tzaddikim. Yes? <laughs> not really, but... <laughs> so you want to take an animal that's physically perfect, no moom, no blemish, and you need an animal that's also not spiritually perfect, but has no spiritual deficit. And that's why you take an animal, because animals have no... Correct. So now we begin to understand why we want a human. And what type of humans did they sacrifice? Children. Children! Why children? Same Same reason. First of all, you take a child that doesn't have a moom. Okay, we make sure physically there's no blemish. And then we know children before a certain age have no sin. So therefore, there's a very common thing, especially for the Goyim. It's a good way of expiating your sin by an innocent child dying for you 
And this way, you were atoned supposedly for your sin. There's only one problem with that. Who gives atonement? Hashem. That's right. And what does God say about this type of practice? It's disgusting. It's an abomination. He hates it in multiple places. Aside from the fact that that's murder. So how about the Abraham Avinu? Yeah, that was just oh, Avram Avinu. It was different. Very good question. It was a special case. But it didn't have to do it. How do you know you're not a special case? God comes to any one of the fathers in this room. Don't children going in nervous. God comes to any fathers in this room and says, Take your son to Haram Oriyah ve Haleu Sham Le'Allah. Bring him as a Ola on one of the mountains over there. Wow. He won't do that, but let's just say, let's like, hypothetical. But he wasn't a child back then. He was? Isaac was not a That's okay. He was willing to go. He said, no problem, Dad. Whatever you say, I'm, I'm, I'm on. I'll get a Lama Ba quickly. I won't have to work for it. What would be a man's answer nowadays? No way. Is it time for sugar? Why no? You crazy? You cherish life. What is the difference between Abraham Avinu and every Jewish man in this room? He's a lot better than all. He's better than that. Then that doesn't help us on that one. Thank you. It was before Matan Torah. Before Matan Torah, whatever God told Abraham to do, he had to do. God tells him to cut himself, he cuts himself. God tells him to uh, sacrifice his son, he sacrifices his son. Once the Torah was given, now everything changes. Oh, One second. So much so, that there's a very interesting phrase that rabbis teach us. I'll say it in Hebrew, and then I'll translate it. Kol asher omer lecha balabait aseh, hutzmitzeh. Whatever the master of the house tells you to do, you should do, except to leave. Wow, imagine that. <laughs> Somebody invites you over to their house for Shabbat for lunch. And they told you ahead of time they want to take a nap, 2.30, so they can go to the shir at 4.30. Comes time, 3 o'clock. The Balabite already says, you know what? Please, time to go. No, the rabbi said, I have to listen to whatever you say except to leave. I'm moving in. <laughs> what does this mean with the Chachamim are selling? Every, the Balabite says, by the way, here's a wonderful veal parmesan sandwich. <laughs> Eat the veal parmesan, no problem. What, we suspend all the laws of the Torah when you go to somebody's house? <laughs> except to leave. How rude. So we have to understand who's the Balabite. <coughs> the Balabite is God. Whatever God tells you to do, you have to do, except Semidatcha, leave your religion. Which means, even if God comes to you in a dream and tells you to sacrifice your son, and you know it's God, he would never do this, but let's just say Fahavamina, yeah? You say, with all due respect, your Melech Malchei HaMlachi Majesty, no, the Torah says I'm not allowed to do that. And that's the right answer for that test. But also, God told Abraham do this and this, Ba'olam Shoya Pagani, yes? Pagani, what's Pagani? Oh, pagan, yeah, okay. I love that word in Hebrew, Pagani. <laughs> so, so I think that God wanted to teach him, look, you don't, I told you to do this, but now I'm teaching you don't do like this, because this is not the way. Okay, so if that was God's intention, right. why wouldn't he have said, listen, Abraham, you know all these goyim in the world, they yeah. sacrifice their children? Uh -huh. Don't you ever do that! Yeah, but and tell your son and tell your grandson, don't you ever do that! He told him in the end. Why would he tell him in the beginning? That's not a satisfactory answer. Not a satisfactory answer. It was a test. That's what the Torah says. The yeah. Torah says it was a test. It's a test. And God wanted to test to see how much Abraham loved him. So, and at that, at that particular time, since there was no Torah, God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son could be okay. And his son was willing. So 
in one way it's emona, right, in God, in the other so, way uh, the lesson. So is it permitted for the going to do it? No. So it says in the Torah for, for the Jews. Yeah, the but Torah they have seven laws of Noah, don't they? Ooh, good okay. question. Well, it's so murder. It's murder. It's not yeah. murder. And the Vodazar, which they do also. They do wow. Also. They also believe in original sin. That, hold That's on. Hold that. Hold that. Stop yeah. it. That's good. That's Kachko. You're right. Abraham should have said, "Excuse me. You told Noah that we can't kill." They had seven laws of Noah. That's his question. I don't have an answer. I gotta think about that. Thank you. I get back to you on that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> what I just said is very important, and we'll, we'll get back to the topic of what I have to talk about. I'm so sorry, I'm getting a little deviation over here. I came a little early, so maybe I can stay a little later. What if I tell you, and it's comical. That you would take a child, or you would take an innocent, kill that child, and think that that atones for your sin, right? And it's even more ridiculous to say to yourself that not only can I kill this child for the sins I did in the past, but I can kill this child for the sins I'm going to do tomorrow. Ridiculous, yes? Is this supported anywhere in the Torah? Is this supported anywhere in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible? Absolutely not. There is no support for this. What if I tell you there are 2.7 billion people in this world that believe that? Christianity is based on the sacrifice of the innocent Paschal Lamb. They're so stupid they don't realize that Paschal Lamb is not a sin offering, but we'll leave that alone. The innocent Lamb was crucified, and because of that, their sins are forgiven for all eternity. This is preposterous. Wow, they have to go and, to and it's the mother load of human sacrifice. This is a problem. From a theological point of view, they have zero basis in the Hebrew Bible for this concept. And their entire concept of forgiveness of sin rests on this. And was that a good thing he did that? No, he didn't. All right, so? How come he did it? Because I mean, he was foolish. Then why did they go to confession? I don't know. You have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to the topic here. So the esh, this esh, very nice. Someone said, what is this esh? So I told you were three fires on the altar. One was called the Ma'aracha Gedola, and that's where they brought the sacrifices. Today, we don't have sacrifices, unfortunately. What do we have instead? Prayer. Prayer. So we understand the Maracha Gedola represents the esh that has to be when a person is praying. And we'll see what that esh is in a second. On the side of the Maracha, it says that there was fire there that was used for the Ketoret. What does the Ketoret represent? Torah and mitzvot. When a person does Torah and mitzvot, also has to have esh. And what about the last one? The fire that's sitting there and the entire purpose of that fire is just to maintain the other fire. What does that represent? The, the human soul. Emunah in what? Hashem. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're done. Class over. I'm going to give you a class on faith. Ready? Here it goes. Believe in God. Okay, where's, the, where's dinner? A child at the age of six years old, when they go to yeshiva, they learn a song. Hashem is here. Hashem is there. Hashem is truly everywhere. Up, down, round, and round. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah? My kids used to sing this all the time. For a six-year-old or an eight-year-old, that's great. When a person is 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, or whatever age they are, do we think it's satisfactory that that's what we have as far as our emunah Hashem is concerned? 
How much time do we spend studying emuna? Spend a lot of time. We think it just comes in by osmosis by studying Torah. No. A person has to study about emuna. How does a person do that? Go buy one of Rabbi Arusha's books on emuna. How do you do that? Okay, same author. <laughs> What's that? What do you think about? Skies, moon, stars. What do you think about? Palm trees and meadows and brooks and streams. What do you think about? Vacation in Hawaii. What do you think about? Okay, now we've got a circular reasoning over there. We think about mitzvot, so we do mitzvot, and that's all. There's a mitzvah called Anochi Hashem Elokecha. How do we fulfill that mitzvah? I believe in God. Okay, next. Wow. Shema is a separate mitzvah. It doesn't say the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu. Of course it says that. What does that mean? Do you know what that means? Yeah, hear Israel. Why is God's name there twice? Three times. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Yudke Vavke Elokeinu Yudke Vavke Echad. What is that? Rachamim Din, Rachamim. He can't make up his mind which one he is. <laughs> okay, tell me what that means in relation to what you just said. Okay, that doesn't say that in Shema. It doesn't say God builds everything. We just said that in the bracha before the Shema. Yotzer or Choshech, right? Ose Shalom Bore Takol. Yes? Except that's not the Pasuk. The Pasuk is Ose Shalom Bore Ra. That's the Pasuk. We change it. Ose, uh, right? Hakol. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. What does that mean? Why is God's name Yudke Vavke, then Elokeinu, then Yudke Vavke? So I'm going to quote you a Pasuk. Ani Rishon, Vani Acharon, Umibal Adai, and Elohim. I was in the beginning. I am at the end. And in the middle, there is no Elohim. That's what it means, right? Umibal Adai, and other than me, there is no God. But Elohim is the name of God. Yes? What does that mean? This is what we mean we have to study at Muna. <laughs> Before the world was created, there was only God. After the world should disappear, I don't mean world, I mean universe, there's only God. In the middle, there's the appearance that there's other things. But really, there's nothing else. And odd. In Shema Yisrael, what are we saying? Shema Yisrael. Yud ke vav ke. That's Ani Rishon. Elokeinu. Umi baladai en Elokim. That's in the middle. That's where we are now. We think there are other forces in the world. We don't recognize that all these forces come from the same source. And nothing changed about God ever. I am God, I never changed. And then the second Yud Kevavke, which means nothing changes about God. The only thing that changes is we're here and we have the illusion that there's bad. That's the deeper meaning of Shema Yisrael. And that's giving you a picture of all the existence of the world. That last Ma'aracha represents the obligation of every Jew, men and women, to spend time studying about God. Yes, he wants you to study the Torah. Yes, he wants you to do the mitzvot. But everything has to be done L'shem Shamaim 
What does that mean, L'shem Shamaim? In the name of God. In the name of God. In the name of the heavens, yes? Let me read you a bracha that all of you know. Baruch ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddishano B'Mitzvotav V'Tzivano Al Divrei Torah. Yes, everybody heard about that one. The Ashkenazim say La Asok Ba Torah. Okay, Achenu, very nice. I'm reading from a Sephardic Sidur. This is a Sephardic congregation of Yulit. The Ha'arev Na Hashem Elokeinu. Ha'arev, which means make it sweet. Yudke Vavke, our God. The words of Torah in our mouth, which means make it sweet for us. It should be hard to learn Torah. It should be easy to learn Torah. Please, God, make it sweet for us to learn. And not in our mouth, it's not enough for it to be in my mouth. And in the mouths of all of your nation, the house of Israel. And let us, meaning me and all of me, my people, and my descendants, and the descendants of my descendants, because every Jew is responsible for two generations, not one. Which means you're not just responsible for your children, you're responsible for your grandchildren. If you have the school to live long enough, maybe you can also have some responsibility for your great-grandchildren. But most of us are not going to be able to see them get to the point where they get married. But you have a responsibility for children and grandchildren. And also the descendants of Amichab Israel. Now this is Birchat Torah. Everybody knows that, yes? Kulanu. What should we all be? Yodei Shemecha. Whoa. In Birkat Torah, we have the concept of Yodea Shem. Not just one name. All of his names. How many names does God have? That's a trick question. <coughs> Infinite <coughs> and none. Those are the only two right answers to that question. Infinite because a name causes there to be a limitation. If you're Isaac... You're not Jacob. If you're Jacob, but not Joseph. Every name a person is limiting them. So if you're going to give names to God, there's an infinite amount of names. That's when Moshe asked. One second. No, that's something else. That's something else. In that, he was asking, which midah are you rescuing the Jewish people in? That was Moshe's question. They're going to ask me, who sent me? Yeah. And he said, Eh right? That's what he said. Yeah. There is no name for me. No. Eh is a name. Eh is a name? Oh, yeah. I. Ah, trust me. Ah, you can do it there. Book Share Munah, 1250. Look it up. It's right there. As a matter of fact, it's the highest name of God. Okay? So, what have you seen the Sidurus Hashem? Wait a minute a second. So either God has an infinite amount of names because when you limit something but there's an infinite amount of limitations and what are you saying? There is no limitation, yes? Or you can say something else. He doesn't have a name. God, we, we call him but we're not really calling his essence. We can say nothing about the essence of God. All we can say is how he relates to us. Does he relate to us with mercy? Does he relate to us with deen? Does he relate to us with... So how he relates to us, this is how we can describe him. But if you want to talk about his name, the essence, he has no name. There is no name that can summarize all of him. Because he's everything. This is what Yodei Shemecha means. And do we study the different names of God? And then it says, What is Lishma? I said Lishem Shemaim, but that's not what the Bracha says. What is Lishma? For her name. Yes? Lishma. 
Mapike in Hebrew, possessive feminine, yes? Lishma, Fohane, what name? So in order to learn Torah, Lishma, you have to know the names of God. Which means to study the names of God, this is how you get to know God. And this is represented by that third fire that supports all the other fires. Which means you want to have tefillah, you have to know the names of God. You want to learn Torah, you have to know the names of God. You want to do mitzvot, you have to know the names of God. How can I prove it to you? You open up a Sephardic Sidur, not Ashkenaz, Ashkenaz, Hineni Muchanim Zuman. Achenu. Leshem Yehud Kutra Berichu Shchintei. For the purpose of unification, unifying. Leshem, for the name, purpose of na- unifying Yuchud Kutra Berichu Ushchintei. Kadosh Baruchu and the Shechina. These are all names of God. And every mitzvah a person does, there's a concept of unifying a God's name through performing mitzvot. Unifying God's name through learning Torah. Unifying God's name, Yichudim, for those who study, through tefillah. If you open up the Sidur Avodat Hashem, hopefully you might have it over here. Some of the other Sephardic uh, Sidurim have it as well. Some of them don't. There's a halacha in the Shulchan Aruch. Let me just find it. <clears throat> it's the fifth siman of the Shulchan Aruch. And over there it talks about kavanat haberachot. What kavana a person is supposed to have when he makes a bracha? You would think this is going to be a very, very long seif because he's a siman, because he has to explain the kavana of every single bracha. Baruch Hashem. There's hundred brachot. No, it's got three sentences. Because it's not talking about the kavanah of the brachot, of the meaning of the end part of the pasuk, right? Hamotzi lechem in aretz. We know what that means. Asher kedushal mitzvah tzivana am netilat yadayim. We know what that means. The question is, do we know what Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam means? Which is the piece of every bracha. Shulchan Aruch says, a person has kavana when he makes a bracha. By the way, this halacha is for men and women. Women make brachot? Yes. Therefore, they have to know this. Perush hamilot. You make a bracha, you have to know the meaning of the words. Okay, that's basic. Kishayaskir Hashem. When he's going to mention the name. Yechaven perush kriato beadnut. How do we read Yud Kei Vav Kei? Amonai. We don't read it as Yud Kei Vav Kei. Rabbi Akiva says if you do that, Hahoget Hashem biotiyav otiyotav en lo chelach lamaba. So we don't read the name Yud Kei Vav Kei as it's written. We read the name Yud Kei Vav Kei Aleph Dalad Nun Yud. So when a person is reading that Yud Kei Vav Kei. And he's reading it as Amunai. He has Kavana, Shehu Adon Hakol. That he is the master of all. What does Adonai mean? Master, master of everything. Adoni is my master. Adonai is everybody's master. That's what Yud Kevavke means as we read it. Then the Shulchan Aruch says, V'yachaven b'chitivato. But that's not what it says in the Sidur. In the Sidur, it's got a Yudke Vavke there. So a person also have, has to have Kavana from the way it would be read if we would have the Zuchut to be able to read it. B'yudke, Shehaya hove ve'yihye. He was, he is, he will be. That's what Yudke Vavke is. It's a contraction or a composition of the three being verbs in Hebrew. Haya was, Hove is, Yihye will be. What are we trying to say with that? Uh, 
unbound by time. Time is not a concept that God is bound by. There is nothing that God is bound by. But time is certainly a creation. Ani Rishon, Vani Acharon, Umibaladai, and Olakim. Vis a vis God, there's no difference between Adam Harishon and every man in this room. We're all the same time. It's all the same. For God, there is no past. For God, there is no future. There is only present. We have a past. We have a present. We have a future. Why? Because we are bound by time. For God, there is only present. Yes? Have, have you ever seen the book Pathway to Prayer at all? I've heard of it. Because every time you get to uh, UK Vavke, it says exactly what you just said. Well, Pathway to Prayer got it from the Shulchan Aruch. Well, maybe they did, but, uh, but, but every time... And the Shulchan Aruch got it from the Talmud. Yeah, 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 yeah. so every time you get to UK Vavke... That's what exactly what it says. Good, and it says in the Siddur Avodat Hashem also. <laughs> it's in the Amidah, it's in every bracha. Every bracha. Not done. We just did one. There's another name there. Elokeinu. Ubehazkiro Elokim. When he mentions Elokim, Eloheinu is Elohim Shelanu. Yes. So it's the name Elokim, yes. Yechaven. He has to have Kavana. Shehu Takif, that he is powerful. Baal HaYecholet, the source of all potential. Ubala Kochot Kulam, and the source of all the forces in the world. Ever wonder why the name of God Elohim is plural? When we refer to Abu Dazara, we say Elohim Ahirim. Other gods. Aherim over there is plural. When we refer to God, we say Elohim. <coughs> but it's plural, isn't it? If you understand the meaning, you understand why. Elohim represents that God is the source of all the forces, all the strength, all the powers. We living in this world right now, we have lots of things acting on us. The sun acts us on the day. The moon acts us on at night. We have to recognize that the source of all of the kochot in the world, in the universe, is God. That's why the name is plural. Because we are being interacted at by multiple forces. But it's the emunah that teaches you what? That it's all coming from one source. And that's God. This is the fire. The fire is the understanding of about Hashem. And by the way, Hashem has other names. There are seven names that are not erased. There are really ten different names, combinations of names. I said there are an infinite number of names. How do we know there's an infinite number of names? We have a mitzvah to make brichot Torah, yes? According to many of our poskim, that mitzvah is from the Torah. Really? It <laughs> says in the Torah that you have to make a bracha before you learn Torah. <laughs> Everybody knows there's one bracha that's very, very straightforward that's from the Torah. Which one? Birchat Amazon. Ve'achalta. Okay, in that pasuk, there is, and you shall eat, and you shall be sustained, you shall be satisfied. Uberachta, not with a het, uberachta, uberachta, being what? You should make a beracha. So that's pretty clear. There's no question about Birkat Amazon being from the Torah. What pasuk in the Torah tells you that you have to make a bracha on the Torah before you learn? That's, what's the pasuk? I don't remember that pasuk in the Chumash. Okay, that's not in the Chumash though. If we're saying it's learned out as a pasuk, it's learned out from the Torah, it's a, it's a Torah commandment. Where do we learn it from? From the Torah. Shema Yisrael, where does it say in Shema Yisrael, you make a bracha in Hashem's name? Don't we... 
Show me where it says, where does it say bracha? Don't I don't we, see the word bracha in Kriyat Shema. Don't we say it before we take off the Torah on, on, on Shabbos? What do we say? Uh, Torah Siva Lan and Moshe. Is, uh, that's Torah Tziva. God, Moshe commanded us the Torah and a heritage for all Keilat Yaakov. Where does it say that you have to make a bracha? Thank you! The Pasuk says, Ki Shem Adonai Ekra Havu Godel Lelohenu from Ha'azinu. Ki, when? I call the name of God. Before I do that, I have to give Godel Lelokenu. What is Godel? I have to give him praise. What's that called? Bracha. And from here the Chachamim learn that we have a mitzvah from the Torah to say Brikat Torah. Yeah, but the way to say it once. How do they refer, how does the Pasuk refer to the entire Torah? Shem Hashem. Which means the entire Torah are the Shemot of God. And before you do that, Yatsi Bichot Torah. In fact, it says in Masechet, I think it's in Megillah, the Tanakh tells us the reason why the first temple was the, the reason why the Jewish people were thrown out of the land of Israel, al ozvam et torati. And the Gemara says, what? They left the Torah? No, they didn't. They were learning Torah. What do you mean, al ozvam et torati? So it says, no, they were learning Torah. That wasn't the problem. They weren't making the bracha before they learned Torah. And the Gemara says, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that a person is sitting there and steiging for three hours learning Torah and he didn't make the bracha beforehand? What's harder, to steig for three hours or spend 15 seconds and say the bracha? So the Gemara <laughs> says, no. They were saying birchot Torah. But they weren't appreciating what it means. Asher bachar ban mikol ha'amim do they recognize what that means? How many people in the world, how many nations can claim that God gave them a book and they're right? Only one. Only one. The rest are full of baloney. <laughs> the rest are full of baloney. The Christians don't even claim that God gave them a book. They claim that Paul wrote the book. And uh, regarding uh, Muslims, they claim that book was in the Shemaim from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeah, good luck with that. And Haman was a servant in the house of Achashverosh. Very, very good, yeah. You keep that up. So we recognize how important it is to get to know God. And how important the mitzvot that you do. And the Torah that you do. How much more meaning it has when it is invested with knowledge of God. And that has to be studied. There's a great book called Derech Hashem. If you haven't read it, read it. Rabbi Arya Kaplan, read it. It's not by him, it was Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, translated into English by Rabbi Arya Kaplan. You want to get to know God? That book teaches you on a low level, What's even though it's a very complicated book. Derech Hashem, the way of God. That's how you get to know God. You have to learn. And it's not just enough to study the laws of Shabbat. And it's not just enough to study Parashat HaShavuah. A person has to spend time learning about God. We know that the entire Mishkan was built with something called Mahashava. Lahashov Mahashavot. It says that multiple times. Which means everything that was done in the Mishkan had to be done with thinking. thinking. Not parrots. Not like a tuki, right? Anashim hmm. milumeda. A person has to do mitzvot with kavana, with thought, with intent. 
What happens if a person brings a korban and either he or the kohen says, you know something? This korban has to be eaten in one night. I'm going to eat it two nights from now. That's called pigul. As we read in last week's parasha, Vim heachol yeachel mi besar zeva shalama ba yom hashem hashel ishi lo yeratze hamakriv oto lo yachashev lo piguli yeva never shachem imena abonot isa. Which means, if a person, the kohen, is thinking about a different date, he's going to eat it, which is beyond the date that he's allowed to eat it. That is called pigul. He damaged the korban. How the animal is kosher, the animal is perfect, has no blemish. His thought causes there to be the animal is now pigul. And if a person eats that, it's karet. That's what avonah isa tisa is karet, very severe. And the Torah, what does it say? Lo yeratze. What is lo yeratze? It will not be the ratzon of Hashem. Which means, when a person doesn't use his mind and think about what they're doing and have intention and what they're doing, or here, where they have an intention that is a, not a normal intent, not a right intention, it can, it can mess up the action the person is doing. We have another concept in the Torah we learn later on. Same idea. You are not allowed to bring etnan zona. What is etnan zona? Etnan zona goes like this. A lady has something for sale that she's not supposed to sell. For the benefit of the young children here, I won't be more specific. Hopefully the adults in the room will know what I'm talking about. And I have a goat. Or the per- Reuven has a goat. And he says, you know what? Let's have t- find some fun later on. And you can keep the goat. And she says, great idea. And she takes the goat. And of course she engages in something. And it has to be a zona, which basically means a woman that he's not allowed to be with. She's eshet ish, or she's a married, she, she, she's a erva for him in some way, shape, or form. Here the Torah is not talking about that. Not here, but in Yeshua. Uh, Shemati. Okay, very good. Boys have to do it here. Here's not etnan zona. He's talking about what the zona means, really. Not that she's just sustaining from the word mazon. She's sustaining in a different way. Now she has this goat. And she says, oh my God. Holy moly. I owe a sacrifice to the temple. It's min hashamayim that I got this goat. Let me take this as a temple for the sacrifice. That is a lot Et nan zona, which means the benefit of the zona, which means she, okay. There's another one here, mechir kelev. What is mechir kelev? I have a dog. I don't like the dog. And I got a person over there, he's got a goat. I like the goat. So I say, you know what? I'll trade you my dog for your goat. He says, you know what? That's great. And I take the goat and I give him my dog. Now I say to myself, oh my gosh, how serendipitous. I have a sacrifice to bring to the temple. Let me take this goat to the temple. That's called Mechir Kelev. Both of them a person is not allowed to bring to the temple. Why not? Because when he's bringing the sacrifice, or when she's bringing the sacrifice, they're going to remember how they acquired the goat. And that thought is a disgusting thought, and that damages the korban. The second one is a trading. What's wrong with that? A dog. You trade a dog because the dog is not kosher? Uh, it only is a dog. You can't walk a goat. Only in the case of the dog. Only a dog. A dog is not exactly a favorite animal in our sources. Despite the fact that it's man's best friend. <laughs> I 
Not a good idea. Especially if the dog barks every time somebody walks by. That's a problem of ma'ke. You have to build a ma'ke on your roof, yes? To protect someone who's falling. Because if somebody falls, you're responsible, yes? From here we learn that a Jew has to be very, very cautious not to have something in their house that can cause damage to other people. The dog barking, pregnant woman walks by, gets scared, has a miscarriage. Guess whose responsibility that is? It's not the dog's responsibility. The dog's doing what he's trained to do. It's your responsibility because you have a dog. Ah, a dog that doesn't bark, that's a little cute little thing that doesn't bother anybody. All right, you know, but there's all kinds of dinim with the dog. A lady comes up from mikveh. The first thing she sees is the dog. There's a question if she has to go back. No, it's the first thing she sees is a dog or a Gentile. It says in the Sfarim that uh, a man who has relations with a Gentile woman, when he goes to Shemaim, there's a Kelev biting at his feet. <laughs> and everybody knows in Shemaim what that means. Imagine that, you're standing before your father, your grandfather, great-grandfather, and there's this dog biting at your feet, and they all know what that means, if you didn't do Teshuvah for that. Okay? So we see a dog is not exactly... Uh... Now we go to next week's parasha. I'm almost done, I promise you. In Parashat Shemini, we have a tragedy. We have the happiest day in the world for Aharon. And then there's a tragedy. What's the tragedy? What does the Pasuk say? Each one took his shovel. And they put fire in the shovel. And they put incense on the fire. Vayakrivu lifnei Adonai esh zara. And they brought before God a strange fire. Ashelotzi vautam. That they were not commanded. Next pasuk. Vatetze esh milifnei Adonai. And a fire left from the Mizbeach. Vatochalotam and ate them, Vayamutu Lifne Adonai, and they died before God. What's the Esh Zara? All the Mefarshim deal with this. Rashi says they went in drunk. Why? Because the next thing commanded is Yain Vashivishar al Tesht. Woe unto those that have a kiddish club in the shul, not in the right time. <laughs> Yain v'shechar al tesht. You shall not drink. Right? That's what it says. And then what it says after that is what? Atau banechi tah bevo'achem el oil moed. When you come to oil moed. Ve'lot tamutu. Meaning, you're drunk and you're praying. You're taking your life in your head. Other people say they went in, they weren't married. Other people say they were more halacha lifnei rabban. They taught halacha before their teacher. All those things to me sound like sins, yes? Drinking before when you're going to the temple, that can't be good, yes? Giving halacha before your teacher, that can't be good, right? You're young, impetuous, that can't be good. What's the problem with all those ideas? Well, you can get the death penalty for some of them. There's a much bigger problem. Aharon sees this happen. Shook. Doesn't know, I mean, shock. Imagine this. To go from the height of ecstasy and seeing two of his sons die. What does Moshe Rabbeinu say to him? Vayome Moshe Aaron. Doesn't say, I'm so sorry. 
Does it say Tenuchamu Mina Shamayim? Does it say Hamakom Yanachem Etchem Betok Shara Aveli? You can't even say that. The bodies are still there. What does he say? Who Asher Diber Adonai Lemor? This is what God said. Bikrovai Ekadesh. With my close ones, I am sanctified. And by this, I will be honored amongst the entire nation. Vaidom Aaron. Aaron was quiet. Wow, Moshe Rabbeinu, what a consolation. You told him, really what the Gemara says is Moshe Rabbeinu told him that I thought on the inauguration of the Mishkan that it was going to be you or me that were going to die. But when I saw your two sons die, I realized that they were both better than both of us. That's nice. That's a beautiful, beautiful consolation. And Aaron was satisfied with that. But we have a question. Bikrovai Ekadesh, what does that mean? If they sin, how are they close to God? I thought that when you sin, you put a distance between you and God. Moshe Rabbeinu is lying, Chas Shalom. So all these answers that say that they did something wrong in sin, how do we answer Bikrovai Ekadesh? They had holy intentions. Then why'd they die? Because they were drunk. And, and, then that's a sin. Yeah, so go around the circle. They wanted, to, they wanted to die? I don't think the boys wanted to die. I could be wrong. I don't think the boys had intention of dying. They were not supposed to do something. No. No, as a matter of fact, the Talmud says, you want to say, well, they brought a fire from outside. That's not allowed. The Talmud says that you're allowed to bring a fire from outside. It's good to bring a fire from outside. When they did something, not the fiat Thank you. I want to know what it is. Um, what is Esh Zara? They took it from the Mizbeah. Where are you supposed to take it from? They took it from their own campfire? And the other parasha, it says don't take the fire from the They cannot take the fire We just said that they take the fire to do the Mizbeah of the Ketoret, yes? So that's a sin. They violated the Torah. Yes, they violated the Torah. Violating the Torah does not make you close to God. Thank you. That's what it says. What does that mean? You have to be able to tell me how it's Esh Zara and it's not a sin. That's what I'm asking. An alien fire? Alien fire. That's a direct translation. What is an alien fire? That E.T. came down and brought fire from, uh, from his planet? What did we say before? What is Esh? What is Esh? Esh represents the proper Kavana. Esh represents L'Shem Shamayim. Esh represents Lishma. They did an action. The action was a holy action. The action was a mitzvah. But the strange fire was they did it for themselves. That's why it says Ish Machtato. They went into the Kodesh as individuals. When a person approaches God, they're supposed to approach Him as nobody. I am nobody. My great-great-great-grandfather was Abraham, and my great-great-grandfather was Isaac, and his great-great-grandfather uh, Jacob. I can come talk to you, not because I'm important. I'm nothing. How was Moshe Rabbeinu able to go to Har Sinai 
120 days, 40 times 3. Lechem lo achalti umayim lo shatiti. Able to go and have the greatest revelation of God in the history of man. Because Moshe is anav mikol adam asher pene adama. Moshe, when he went in, did nothing for his own interest. It was all for Klal Yisrael. What about the first time? When Nadav and Avihu went into the Kodesh, they went in as individuals. What's the problem with that? Their goal was to get close to God. Yes. We all want to get close to God. Yes. But we want to be able to not get too close. Everybody wants to meet God. Nobody wants to meet Him now. How does one protect themselves when they get close to God they don't get burned? You have to make yourself into nothing. That protects you because the fire, when it comes out to destroy, there's nothing there. If there's something there, the fire takes it. So we begin to understand when we pray. How do we pray? Shomea tefilati, Shema koli, Refaini. I know if you're Hungarian, you say Refaini instead of Refainu, but they really mean Refainu. All of our tefilot are betoch she'ar am Yisrael. We are not coming to God as individuals. We are coming to God as part of the nation of the Jewish people. And when we do that, we can approach, and we don't have to worry that we're going to get taken before our time. Esh Zara represents a foreign or an un, improper thought. Not L'Shem Shemaim. And this was basically what they did before, but were not punished. Before, by Har Sinai, what does it say? Elohim, And they saw God and they ate and they drank. So the simple meaning of that is really, you're having a vision of God and you have to have your hamburger. <laughs> But that's not what's going on. What does it mean Vayocholu Vayishtu? Contrast that with Moshe Rabbeinu. Arba'im yom. Lechem lo achalti. Umayim lo shatiti. Now Moshe Rabbeinu really didn't eat and drink. Yes. But there's a deeper meaning. When Moshe Rabbeinu had his visions of God on Har Sinai and got close to God, there was no personal interest there. That's what it means. Lechem lo achalti, umayim lo shatiti. When Nadav and Avihu by Har Sinai, they saw God, vayechelu vayochelu vayishtu, what does that mean? Yeah, they ate and they drank, but it also means that they got personal benefit from that. And that is very, very dangerous. And that's what it means when a person should do things l'shem shamayim. The more l'shem shamayim that it is, and the less l'shem atzmo, because that's the opposite. If it's not l'shem shamayim, then who's it for? It's for you. And if it's for you, that prevents you from getting close to God. That's right. The message of the Torah is it's not about you. It's about everyone else. Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was on the mountain, Lech red ki amecha. You don't belong here. If they're sinning, go away from me. Moshe's position close to God was because of Klai Yisrael. Our position close to God is because of Kla Yisrael. And that's the message of these two parashot. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.